Yeah. Okay, you're good to go. No, no, no password. Just welcoming people to enter. I just see the the number going up. Yeah. As people are joining us, let's wait for a few seconds to to get as many as possible before we start. So we jumped over 200. I think we can start. <laughs> People will, will come in. Okay, so uh, hello everybody and welcome to this webinar dedicated to uh, the UI World Architecture Day. Uh, I have to remind you that uh, this type of event was invented in a UIA Congress in 1996 in Barcelona. So some years ago, we celebrate every first Monday of the month of October, the World Architecture Day. Today we have uh, a generic, which is toward a better urban future. And I think this generic doesn't belong only to us, but belongs to, to everybody in the world because an estimated of 55% uh, of the world's population lives in urban areas. And this is expected to rise to 68% by 2050. The exploding urban population growth creates unprecedented challenges, including water and sanitation, air quality, green spaces, housing, and others. Such challenges have been thrown into sharp relief in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic which has severely impacted urban living. The pandemic is nevertheless generating global discussion about the potential for transformation in urban areas. And UIA World Architecture Day 2020 presents an opportunity for architects and urban planners to engage meaningfully in that discussion, whether it be showcasing their work or organizing events. So here we are and allow me to introduce Thomas Vonier, the president of UIA. Tom, uh, please let me say a few words about you for those which don't know from the perspective of the career. Thomas is based in Paris and Washington DC. He worked in the, on the challenges of urbanization, conflict, urban insecurity, and changing climate patterns and other matters related to the built environment collaborating with clients in the public and private sectors to secure industrial operations, hotels, university and commercial facilities. He is uh, currently holding, as you know, the, the position of uh, president of UIA and he's leading the policy of our profession in the world. Thomas, the screen is yours and please introduce your honorable uh, guests. Thank you so much, Sherban, and uh, welcome to all of our participants. I'll start by extending a special note of gratitude to UN Habitat and to UNESCO for joining us today. I will come back to our guests. I'm going to make some, some uh, introductory uh, remarks about uh, UIA, and I'll ask for the screen now. I hope I have it. Uh, you know, when the UIA was founded 72 years ago, uh, it was at a time of uh, enormous need in the wake of a great world war. And a group of architects gravitated to uh, Auguste Perret, the man I showed at the beginning, who was our first president, uh, in the belief that uh, architecture could do something to help the human condition. This isn't the first time that architecture was talked about as a force for good in society. 
Uh, of course, there were precedents after the First World War, uh, led by Le Corbusier and a number of others and the International Congress for Modern Architecture, where there were explicit statements made about the power of architecture and a new sense of design to make a difference in human lives. This is at the same time um, that uh, Esperanto, which had been developed as a, mm -hmm. a universal language uh, early uh, in the 20th century, late in the in 19th century. This was a time of great resurgence of interest, but the UIA, the formation of the UIA in 1948 was really the first time that architects from all around the world came together to make this affirmation. And certainly uh, World Architecture Day is a day upon which we reassert, uh, reaffirm that uh, conviction and vow again to work together to make it reality. Certainly we are still in a world in need. I've said this before, we have perhaps a billion, perhaps more people on the planet who build for themselves and live in the places they build for themselves. Our cities, uh, the great cities of the world have taken on this very dichotomous nature um, where uh, there's contrast between the rich and the poor, those with opportunity and those without. And physically, our cities uh, have taken on the character of this dichotomy. And then, of course, we have the challenges of extreme weather and the fact that all across the globe, places are facing the challenges that come with uh, the changes that are occurring to our climate. And as the Secretary General has mentioned, we are today confronted with the pandemic. So once again, um, as it was the case 72 years ago when UIA was formed, we are a world in need. And here are the purposes of our organization. I think it's important to affirm them at the outset and to reaffirm this conviction that architecture and urban design can improve our condition. So much of the condition of the world today is tied to the way we build and the way we live. And that is why we, along with so many others, have embraced the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations and UN Habitat. You're going to see this diagram, I have a feeling, time after time today. And you will hear from our colleagues in Denmark, our partners in the Danish Association of Architects, about the efforts being made to address every single one of the 17 Sustainable Goals with examples from all around the world of ways in which architecture and urban design can help. I myself am very interested in the subject of infrastructure because it is something that is being talked about in North America in great detail. And I'm very interested in getting away from this notion of infrastructure as something that is simply roads, highways, bridges, um, dams, but are instead uh, the things we need to live the way we want to live and the changes we need to make in the urban environment to support the changes that are so important to us. Everything from moving away from uh, single passenger or single use automobiles to reinforcing the structure of public areas that can be used by all people and enjoyed by all people. To some degree, returning to our, our roots and the historical origins. Again, um, our theme today is this, to improve uh, the urban future through the application of the disciplines of design. Personally, I'm trying to get away from the word sustainable because I think it um, implies that we adhere to the status quo, that we're doing something that is normal and maintainable. I think we're in a mode where uh, design is now uh, imperative. We're in an acute situation, an urgent situation, and uh, that's how I see the world today. Um, thank you for your attention. I now want to uh, bring myself to the um, introduction, if I can get off of shared screen uh, of our participants today. Am I off of shared screen now? Yeah, no. no uh, we are in a gallery view. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, uh, so the shared, shared screen is finished now? Is it? Yeah, you're not. Uh, oh, good. Well, let me introduce the three panelists at the beginning after having set the stage a little bit. First, let me uh, welcome uh, Kai Uwe Bergman from, uh, of course, BIG, uh, who, who is a, a good friend to the UIA and I think someone well known to all of you. 
He is a partner in uh, BIG and uh, in the Bianca Engels Group, uh, based in Copenhagen and New York, uh, London and Barcelona. Kai Ue is responsible for the international business development of the practice and uh, is responsible, I think, for a growing number of projects in Europe, North America, and Asia. I'm very pleased also to welcome Victor Kassub, who is the Assistant Secretary General and Deputy Executive Director of UN Habitat. Uh, with over 30 years of experience in economics, development and finance, and human resources, and executive management, he's worked with the Economic Commission of Africa, the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, the UN offices in Vienna, and a number of other posts. Victor, we're very, very pleased to have you with us today. And finally, uh, for this opening panel, I in introduce Jyoti Hosragar, uh, who is Deputy Director of the World Heritage Center at UNESCO. Unfortunately, Ernesto Ottone is unable to be with us today, and Jyoti, uh, who has a wide range of experience with UNESCO, is very kindly agreed to join us. She holds a PhD in architecture and urbanism from the University of California at Berkeley and uh, is a former founder director of sustainable urbanism and international uh, an NGO in Bangalore, India. So may I open it up to the panelists and Kai Uwe, I, I wonder if I could begin with you to make some remarks. Uh, yes, so uh, everyone, uh, a uh, happy World Architecture Day. Um, I do think uh, we need these kinds of uh, kind of moments to uh, bring focus uh, to uh, our profession um, and how we can actually leverage the profession uh, to uh, think of uh, having a, a larger impact um, on how we think about uh, resources and uh, for me uh, architecture is the art of uh, using resources uh, to create to provide shelter um, and to think about um, how we uh, create the systems uh, in this planet in our cities uh, in our buildings to, um, to 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 think about um, how we manage uh, these uh, finite resources. So I think that uh, I'm very, very thankful for the invitation. Um, I think it's a really incredible panel that with Victor and Jehoti um, to begin to frame a, a conversation that I hope uh, the future panelists will also take on, which is um, how we think systematically. And I think um, you also started, Thomas, by talking about infrastructure. I think it's uh, really important to continuously think about what we do, whether we're a one-person architecture office or a team of hundreds, um, how what we do affects um, the infrastructures and the systems uh, that we build within. And you can go from a single building and think about the water, the sanitation, the waste, um, the energy that these buildings need, uh, you can then move that also up to the scale of a city or a region. And I think uh, for us to, uh, to, to always keep in mind, no matter how small of uh, a design that we are working on, uh, it has those ripple effects. Uh, and in, in small measures, you actually can truly have large impact, especially also if you see what you're doing as something that others can then uh, also have a dialogue with and can work um, and, and can, can learn from. So I think that we're always looking in each of our projects um, how we can have that dialogue with uh, our colleagues, our architectural colleagues, so that we can actually have uh, these, um, these discussions uh, about our environment, about our resource management, and about design. Thank you so much. I, we're gonna come back. I, I think your firm has been 
so successful in capturing the imagination of people in positions of influence um, simply by exercising creative vision and being able to communicate that vision. It's a very powerful and, and beneficial force, uh, I think. So thank you for those opening remarks. Victor Kisab, I wonder if I could turn to you. And uh, as I do, I want again to express my thanks to UN Habitat for sharing this day with us, because it is also your day in a sense, isn't it? Well, yes, indeed. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The one thing we still haven't figured out is how to get everybody in the same time zone. Uh, that's going to take a lot of thinking. But at least every year in October, we jointly celebrate and raise awareness about the importance of sustainable urban development. So Urban October and World Habitat Day are the opportunities we have to demonstrate the global commitment to promoting cities that are inclusive and offer affordable and adequate housing you know, for all. It is my distinct pleasure to participate in this event hosted by the International Union of Architects on moving towards a better urban future. And I'm particularly pleased because it's, it's also an engagement that is taking place on World Habitat Day 2020 and its theme of housing for all, a better urban fusion. So we're basically in sync on this particular issue. But I also like to thank the International Union of Architects for the ongoing collaboration and for the continuously uh, demonstrating the central role that architects play in driving inclusive and sustainable urban development. Now, of course, with COVID-19, we are seeing a significant impact on our cities and our human settlements, and has also exposed some of the harsh realities of many lacking access to basic services, decent housing, um, adequate public spaces. The socioeconomic response to this challenge will be a key pillar to building resilient communities in the future. And we've talked about the issue of, of, of the future. The importance of good, innovative architecture urban planning and management of cities became even more evident throughout the crisis. So this year on World Habitat Day, we have the opportunity to remind ourselves that housing is more than just a roof. It is a fundamental human right. And the starting point to ensure that women, minorities and indigenous people are included and valued in our cities and a vector for socioeconomic inclusion and development. Overall, we estimate there is a lack of adequate housing that people can afford. Families and youth are burdened with housing costs and have less to spend on other necessities as we see almost every single day. And this is one time during the COVID that we see that the necessities that people need, they can barely afford. So the less protected property rights and the security of tenure are, the less that these two things are, the more people are resulting to informal uh, markets and things of that nature. Moreover, globally, there are estimated to be about 150 million people who are homeless. The harsh realities of the housing deficit, homelessness, and tenure insecurity become even more problematic during this uh, pandemic. Well-located and affordable housing and access to basic services are key for inclusion. The stability of a safe home is essential to ensure social and economic inclusion as part of a neighborhood and a community and to access jobs and livelihoods. A housing that is located near places of employment and services can reduce com uh, commuting times and costs and improve the access of residents to urban benefits. This also ensures that neighborhoods are vibrant, integrated and meet the needs of everywhere, everyone. And finally, another key issue is the lack of environmentally sustainable housing. The housing sector consumes significant amounts of energy. Um, and I remarked uh, to myself when you talked about the heating um, that they want to put outdoors now in Paris, there's been talk about that also in New York. And of course, there's an environmental impact when you start doing things like that, especially in a place like New York. But housing itself, households account for about 19% of all total worldwide energy consumption. And the buildings and construction uh, sector accounts for 39% of all process-related carbon dioxide emissions. With the building stock set to double by 2050, emissions, energy, and resource consumption of the sector are also set to increase. 
as an important uh, element that we need to consider, which also has to do with the travel-related energy use and emissions, which are heavily determined by the location and placement of housing and the shape of uh, urban development. This is something we really need to start talking about and, and saying, as you said, looking at the future, what is that we want to do going forward? As to the process of saying, well, the current situation is adequate. And, and you know, so there's a lot for us to do. So UN Habitat promotes building housing that enables sustainable and inclusive communities and cities. That is, in fact, enshrined as part of key mandates that we have. And that's what you see embedded in SDG 11 on communities and cities. Good planning can enable the provision of housing that is connected to livelihood and job opportunities with access to transportation options other than the private car and other services contributing to reduce spatial inequalities and urban sprawl. The global energy consumption and the environmental crisis related to the extraction and manufacturing of construction materials represents an opportunity for architects to innovate, to apply technologies and housing design solutions that would contribute to save energy and use natural resources efficiently. Adequate design and innovation will be key to strengthen urban resilience and allow housing to be a tool in climate change mitigation efforts. The sustainability of the housing sector will be to a large degree determined on how sustainable we, look, we want to see uh, our cities uh, going forward. The future of sustainable urbanization depends on how architects and other practitioners and policymakers position housing as a priority in the public debate around sustainable development. A well-functioning housing sector and access to adequate housing can make a real difference in the lives of our people and the prosperity of our countries and cities. I would like to end by commending the efforts of the International Union of Architects and its commitment to the new urban agenda and the SDGs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Director. Thank you again to UN Habitat for sounding those important notes. I know we're going to return to these themes in the panel discussions coming ahead during the, the next two hours or so. And um, I thank you for sounding those notes because we'll be back to them. I, I conclude this opening uh, session now uh, by asking Jyoti, uh, please, to uh, make your remarks. And then we might have a few minutes for discussion among the four of us. Thank you. Jyoti? Thank you very much. Um, dear Thomas Vanier, President of the International Union of Architects, dear Mr. Seban Beginas, uh, Secretary General of the National Union of Architects, dear Mr. Vic Kisob, Assistant Secretary General and Deputy Executive Director of UN Habitat, and dear Mr. Kai U Bergman, Architect Partner, Business Development uh, of BIG and dear experts. I would like to begin thanking the International Union of Architects for organizing this webinar on the occasion of the World Architecture Day, which also happens to be this year, World Habitat Day. For over 60 years, UNESCO and UIA have established several partnerships to promote our shared values and common goals in the field of architecture and culture. The long-standing collaboration between UNESCO and UIA began in 1956, when an international group of architects developed a set of standard regulations for international competitions in architecture and related fields that were adopted by the General Conference of UNESCO that mandated the UIA to ensure their application. In effect, we have collaborated since 1956 to achieve a better urban future. The Sydney Opera House, the Georges Pompidou Centre in Paris, and the Bamiya Cultural Centre in Afghanistan all realised through the International UNESCO UIA architecture competitions. Our two organisations have jointly elaborated uh, in 1996 the UNESCO UIA Charter for the validation of training of architects. Mass urbanization is, in many places, putting cultural heritage at risk, including as a result of low quality or ill-conceived interventions 
in and around World Heritage Sites, particularly in urban areas. That is why during the World Heritage Committee in Baku in June 2019, the committee welcomed the UIA proposal to prepare in cooperation with the World Heritage Center guidelines for architectural design competitions in and around World Heritage properties in urban areas. And we look forward to developing this new area of collaboration with UIA to promote quality built environment that contributes to the safeguarding of heritage in line with the 2030 Agenda and UNESCO's World Heritage Convention. By improving the quality of the built environment for local communities and promoting innovative solutions for sustainable development, architects can assist in the realization of SG11, Sustainable Cities and Communities. In 2019, our two organizations launched the World Capital of Architecture initiative to associate UNESCO with the designation of host cities of the UIA World Congress as World Capitals of Architecture. Rio de Janeiro has been named as the first World Capital of Architecture as part of our common commitment to preserve architectural heritage in the urban context. Today, the COVID-19 crisis has highlighted the frigidity of cities and the need for action. UNESCO has responded to the unprecedented impact of COVID-19 by ensuring continued access to culture, cultural heritage sites, supporting the resilience of artists and cultural professionals, assessing the impact, building capacity around heritage safeguarding, and mobilizing governance, governments and partners. For example, UNESCO has been organizing the Resiliat debates to mobilize support, rehabilitate heritage and culture and education and promote culture and education. Following the explosions in Beirut, uh, UNESCO organized a Resiliat debate on bring the past and future through built heritage on 24th of September to reflect on ways to support the recovery and build back of the historic neighborhoods of Beirut that were lost and to manage the incessant pressures of rampant commercial development. UNESCO has also been active in different forms to support urban areas in leveraging culture-based strategies to build cities that are stronger, more sustainable, more resilient, and more deeply connected to their histories and landscape. World Heritage Cities Programme has organized in June 2020 a World Heritage City webinar, Urban Heritage for Recovery and Resilience, that included the mayors of seven World Heritage Cities, as well as World Heritage City Lab, to collaboratively develop strategies for urban heritage and sustainable development. This intensive workshop held online served as a platform for more than 50 experts from all over the globe to share, exchange, and develop effective strategies to better manage cultural heritage and respond to the urgent needs of local communities in world heritage cities. This took place over two weeks. We have also launched an online monthly newsletter, Urban Notebooks, on innovative practices regarding urban heritage management have started a new collaboration with the Globe Earth Observation and, and Greece to identify and support response to the risks from the impacts of climate change in world heritage cities. In addition to the 1972 Convention on the Protection of the World Cultural and Natural Heritage, the 2011 UNESCO recommendation on the historic and landscape is another important framework to integrate heritage conservation with sustainable development. The historic urban landscape recommendation provides a framework for intervention in a manner that integrates heritage conservation with creative practice, living heritage, and the needs and aspiration of local communities in urban development. This provides a perfect entry point for architectural design to encourage new thinking and creativity 
towards the goals. Without a doubt, architects and built heritage built environment professionals have the capacity and the responsibility to advance efforts to achieve the UN 2030 agenda by helping make cities sustainable and inclusive and uh, to, to safeguard uh, heritage. Finally, I'd like to thank the International Union of Architects for the work done to support professionals in their reaction to COVID-19, such as the creation of an online database of initiatives, the online webinar, Architects Response in Shape Our Cities that are resilient to pandemic situations, and the resource bulletin published by the UIA Public Health Group. UIA has a leading position to influence professionals throughout the world to use the post-pandemic recovery to create better cities and buildings. We look forward to the release of the Habitat Professionals Forum Roadmap document announced by the, um, the um, statement uh, on COVID-19 to become a guide light in this challenging period. In the recovery from the pandemic, UNESCO and UIA share a deep commitment to build back better, promoting high quality built environment that are people-centered and where creativity and innovation thrive while valuable cultural heritage is protected and respected. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jyoti, for those very gracious and thoughtful remarks. I, I hope we can ask you and Victor and Kai Uwe to send your remarks to us. I think our members would be very, very happy to see them uh, in writing. We have only a few minutes left. Um, I, I think I, I go back to COP21 five years ago in Paris, uh, the Conference of the Parties and, and a, a momentous occasion. There was a mayor who was present from an American city and he stood up at one point and he said, stop telling me we have a problem. Stop telling me that we have to work together. I know that. What is it we can do to make a difference? Show me examples of things that work. And I think that is a, a clarion call to our profession uh, to now focus on, as we, I think, will in the forthcoming panels, uh, examples of things that really make a difference. Uh, before we close this panel, could I just call on you, Kai Uwe, and then you, Victor, and then you, Jyoti, very briefly to say, give us one example of something you have seen that has really made a difference in the urban environment. One project, one gesture, one intervention, uh, Kai Uwe, if it's a project by the Bjarke Ingels Group, that's fine with me. <laughs> uh, if it's not, well, good on you. Um, um, please, just just a very few minutes. Uh, I, I'm actually, I, I think we're living through a project uh, uh, called Humanity uh, right during this COVID uh, time. Um, it's the first time in my life that I have seen uh, with singular purpose a uh, singular kind of focus um, that we are addressing an issue. And I know that there are still nuances to that. I still know that there are many ways that this can play out, but it is, I think, a moment that, combine, uh, that binds us all. Uh, and the hope is that this moment is a teaching moment that teaches us how to frame and how to think uh, about what we do in our lives and how we can actually uh, do better. And uh, so I would say that we are in the midst of a project that it can, it can really have a, a profound effect on, on the future. Thanks for that. Uh, Victor, to you, just briefly, please. Something you've seen or something you know of. You have to unmute, please. Okay, very good. Well, let me let me just share something with you in terms of uh, Kai and Big, and, and he he may well know this. But we signed an MOU with uh, with Big and a few others last year to look at solutions for the future. And one of the solutions that we are entertaining is the whole notion of floating cities. And of course, most recently, people have said to me, uh, "How would that factor in right now with, with the COVID epidemic uh, pandemic that we have?" And I said, "Actually." 
this is probably one of the best times to really take something like that and push it forward. And, and we, as you wouldn't have it that I've been talking about, we're in to see two things. One, a prototype that will really lend itself to where we think the world could go with something like that. And, and secondly, something that is affordable. So it should not be seen as a rich person's um, uh, living uh, environment, but something that everybody around the world uh, could benefit from. So it's something that I'm very positive about, and I, and I think that we, we're at the stage now where we're looking at a prototype location where we could actually put this, uh, do some evaluation, some monitoring, um, and see how something like that could possibly lead us to the future. So that is uh, one of the big things that I'm looking forward to in the next one, two years. Thanks so much. That's very interesting. Jyoti, the last word goes to you. Uh, and. and uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I, I want to say that perhaps um, the, what we find most effective uh, and we have found most effective that has been done by several cities is the integration of the urban development efforts, um, that framing of the urban development efforts with the heritage conservation uh, planning, because very often this kind of separation, you know, the silo silos that that cities tend to operate in when that has been sort of overcome and brought together we have find that that develops a framework that has been very very positive in the way that uh, new development can take place in innovation can take place and still compatible with the way the, uh, the historic parts of the cities and the heritage and the energy has been retained and if you look at urban notebooks or at our work website on the United Cities website, I invite you to look at the uh, urban notebooks. We have been now putting forward several examples, including very recent ones in the COVID situation where uh, there have been efforts, for example, to do urban agriculture, um, which have been efforts that uh, address several different issues in the current situation. Uh, uh, or to reclaim streets uh, in different ways and make them much more human-centered streets, peak-centered streets. I mean, these sorts of efforts, I think, are things that we definitely see uh, our desk designers being able to, to take forward uh, in the current situation. Thanks so much. It's so encouraging to, to have us sounding these notes and to have partnerships with UNESCO and UN Habitat that reinforce what we all believe in so fervently. So um, that's the opening session for Toward a Better Urban Future. Uh, Secretary General Sherban, I'm going to thank our panelists, Victor, Kai, Uwe, and Jyoti, and turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Tom. That was a good start. And thank you to your honorable guests and yourself. And let's dive into uh, problems uh, one by one. So uh, I'm going to, to start uh, with uh, Housing for All and uh, presenting and inviting Nadia Trump. Uh, Nadia, please allow me to say a few words about you for, for uh, our guests and, and public. Uh, Nadia Trump, coming from South Africa, is a director of community architecture, architecture and human rights into UIA. Nadia has practices architecture since 2000 and is currently the director of Ensika Architects. So she's a practicing architect. Uh, she's also the president of Gauteng Institute of Architects, uh, GIFA, a branch of South African Institute of Architects. And as a director of the community architecture work program at the UIA, she's interested in exploring the idea that architecture could be a mechanism for creating social change. Nadia, where are you now? Hi, Shavan. Thank you very much for that introduction and uh, also for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm in Joburg and there's a thunderstorm mm. happening behind me, so I hope it's not mm. too loud. Um, <laughs> but thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to jump right in at Shavan. Please do. Uh, if I could share my screen. It's coming. Is it? <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Do you see it? Yes, yes, full screen. 
Yes, okay. we do. Yes. It's yours. <laughs> okay. Ah, excellent. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so, you know, um, toward a better future, housing for all, um, Nelson Mandela once said, to deny people their human rights is to challenge their very humanity. At the UIA work program, Community Architecture and Human Rights, we see you, uh, housing for all as a basic and fundamental human right. While, uh, according to the UN Habitat, more than 20% of the world's population lack adequate housing, 1 billion people are living in informal settlements, and more than 1 million are homeless. By 2030, the number of people in inadequate housing could increase to 3 billion. Uh, while the need for housing is increasing, particularly in cities, we are keenly concerned about the rapid urbanization. The fact that we are building mega cities with a rapid pace of development speeding up while environmental pressures are increasing, such as climate change, environmental devastation, and the new ecological agenda, it remains a concern. For populations to thrive in cities, they must live in environments that promote dignity, health, and well-being. And we are not always providing and promoting these kind of environments. The housing typology of the high-rise apartment or tower sprawl that exists, which is single living, um, living use only, rather than mixed use, is incredibly destructive for the environment and unpleasant to live in. We need to be thinking about the legacy we're leaving for the future. With the advances in technology and ITCs, comes the opportunity and responsibility to provide access to the most vulnerable of our communities. It also comes with the risk of creating digital inequity along with social inequities that already exist. ITCs um, should be used to connect rather than divide populations. This therefore must be supported by policies which ease the access to technologies for the poorest of the poor. Getting political commitment at the highest level from local government is the first step in creating resilient, equitable cities. Learning from the past through the lens of disasters. The current COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted deficiencies in housing in our urban areas. In the past, innovation has always emerged from disaster or devastation, be it man-made or natural. This is true to a great degree for the developing, development of cities as well. After World War II, the urban destruction caused by the war in the Soviet Union and the satellite states left a large scale devastation and shortage of housing. The Communist Party solution of post-war mass social housing, mostly made of prefabricated parts that could be mass produced, is one of the Soviet bloc's greatest successes and most iconic failures. A few years later, in 1959, when Singapore obtained self-governance from the British, it had a severe, housing, a severe housing crisis, struggling to accommodate the growing population. The Bukit Ho Swee fire in Singapore in 1961 created a huge devastation. 16,000 people were left homeless and the government agency, the Housing Development Board, managed to rehouse the fire victims within a year. New housing was built on the site of the disaster within the next five years. By 1965, the Housing Development Board managed to build 51,000 apartments, rehousing 400,000 people. At that time, a quarter of the then population of Singapore and thereby solving the housing shortage. The reason I include this example is that um, this could only have been achieved by a strong government agency with effective policies and strong political will. In India, architect Balakrishna Dashi demonstrated that while we, while we have concerns about in inequalities in cities, it has been demonstrated that dignity in social housing can be achieved. I, um, Dashi has been an advocate for equity, compassion, and dignity for those that he designs for. The Anya Lo 
Aranya Low Cost Housing Project accommodates 80,000 people with houses and courtyards linked by a maze of pathways in the city of Indore. They are not houses but homes where happy communities live. That is what finally matters, says Dashi on the project. The design allows for incremental growth and space for residents to improve and adapt the design as they see fit. The UIA Social Habitat Work Program is one work program that we work very closely together with. Um, and within this work program, they've set up um, an observatory of social housing to identify an inventory of exemplary projects for, ho for housing for the poor. Here are three projects identified as examples that I'd like to share. The OPOD tube housing is an experimental low-cost housing micro-living unit that seeks to ease Hong Kong's affordable housing problems. Designed by James Law Cybertecture, it provides an alternative for young people who are unable to afford conventional real estate in the current Hong Kong market. The home uses leftover concrete water pipes that have been produced en masse in China for water pipe and, and is large enough for people to live inside. Originally designed for underground use, they are strong enough and safe for human living with inherent good thermal and fire insulation properties. I then want to jump to Burkina Faso, um, where the Gando Teachers Housing Project, designed by Francis Kere, um, is innovative in construction, yet tied to place in terms of the use of materials. The houses are realized in a series of adaptable modules, which are similar in size to the traditional round huts, especially found in this region. Um, single modules can be combined in various ways into a larger composite whole. The simplicity of the design and minimal use of bought materials means that it can easily be adapted by the inhabitants. Um, this project was particularly identified because of the integration of local materials and also the method of integrating the community and getting their buy-in to the project. Construction methods were, um, of the vault, the barrel roof is a, an imported construction method, um, but is usually efficient and climatically efficient within, within the space. And because of the interaction with the community, it became accepted. In France, we look at the Residence Sociale by PPA Architects, which embraces the modular. The property is managed by ADOMA, which is the social housing agency of France. Uh, a 50-unit 50, 50 building was assembled in three weeks. There is innovation in use with these functioning as social residences that accommodate for a maximum of two years any low-income person with housing difficulties. So it's really looking at the in-between space and a temporary solution for people waiting to, to, go, uh, to get social housing. And that, that was innovative in itself. So um, I'd like to now for us to think about the future. I'd like to leave with you um, these innovative approaches of rethinking about the problem and how we can reframe the discussion going forward. Um, this slide eight, the horizontal skyscraper by Hetzog and Demuren, it looks like the adaptive reuse of the Moscow fire station. The design acknowledges the heritage while proposing new communities above that are intertwined with activities below and above, below and above in the new communities. Um, Victor spoke about this a little bit earlier. This project is supported by the UN Habitat, is the proposal by Bjork Engels Group for the floating cities. And just to think about thinking outside of the box, how does one start thinking about different and new approaches to the problem? The creation of a self-sustaining human-made ecosystem in the tropics, which is modular, buoyant, storm-resistant, prefabricated and scalable. And I think scalable is the key word in this, in, in this uh, project. To, in order to create um, any meaningful um, 
uh, change or social change within within the housing um, market or social housing, one has to start thinking about projects that can be scalable. And then lastly, but not least, the beautifully fantastical uh, futuristic idea of the impoverished shanty megastructures by Ole Larkin Jeffers, the Nigerian-born, Brooklyn-based uh, artist stroke architect. The, these images um, just juxtapose sites of privileged and much coveted real estate throughout Lagos, Nigeria, with colossal vertical settlements representing marginalized and impoverished, impoverished communities, the human-centered approach. Um, just to note that this is not um, meant to be presented as an architectural um, solution, but rather to kind of um, start the discussion around how we as architects think about how cities can develop and how uh, people on the ground um, are also thinking about these ideas. So um, thank you. Back to you, Shivan. Oh, thank you very much, Nadia, for this uh, virtual travel uh, with different solutions around the world. But please allow me just one question before you stop sharing the screen and we pass to the next uh, panelist. Uh, how, how do you perceive things today? How, where are we? Are the things improving? Are we still uh, in front of a mental barrier? Or we need to just to, to grab the, the existing solutions and to implement and things are going to, to go in the right direction. How do you feel everything? Maybe it's a very difficult question, but uh, I was uh, waiting to put it to you, to ask it to you. <laughs> oh, it's a big question, but I think for me, there are two, uh, two sides to it that I see. I think that, you know, it's critical that we get um, the, the political um, buy-in and political will to make the change. In order, as we've seen from, from the past, in order to make a significant change, that is absolutely critical, both in terms of funding, but also because uh, uh, also in terms of larger integration with with systems. So, talking a little bit about the IT and so and social justice as well as digital justice and equity, I think it becomes critical that we have that buy-in from cities. Um, as an architect and a practicing architect, I think it's an extreme. It's an extremely exciting time to be an architect because I think that we have to start looking at innovation. We have to, to start thinking differently to the way we thought before and be bold about it. You know, um, I think that the, this problem is a problem, a global problem, and there's an opportunity. There's a real opportunity for architects to make a difference. Well, Nadia, I totally agree with you. Thank you very much again for, for your presentation. And please allow me to, to go further. Uh, we are going to jump into into the water, <laughs> into architecture and the, the water. And please let me introduce the next speaker, which is Max Maurer, uh, coming from Zurich, a scientist and professor at Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, we all know as ETH. Max Maurer is a professor for urban water systems, as well uh, a director of the Institute of Environmental engineering at the Swiss Federal Institute of Te Technology in Zurich. He's the head of the Urban Water Management Department and Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology, and member of the System Engineering Research Cluster, Water Infrastructure Management. His current research focuses on infrastructure transition management for sustainable future, smart urban water management, and modular urban water management. Uh, Max, uh, the screen is yours, the pool is yours. <laughs> Please make your, your speech. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, very flattering and I'm very happy to be here at this, this uh, important event. And um, you know, five minutes, there's lots to talk. And so let me focus on one specific topic that I think uh, where engineers and architects can work much, much more together in order to create a better urban future. And that's a topic of pluvial flooding. And when I say pluvial flooding, then I usually mean very short floods that create quite considerable damages. Here, one example, Switzerland, 35 millimeters of rain in 30 minutes. 
uh, created quite some flooding here. They're local, they're short-lived, but still the damage can be considerable. Very similar here, Berlin, 2019, 61 millimeters in just an hour. And again here, widespread flooding that are fairly short and disappear again and can cause damages. In Switzerland, we estimate that about half of the flood damage that, that uh, occur every year is due to these short so-called pluvial floods that, uh, that uh, occur because there's lack of drainage in the system. So it's not coming from a river. It's not coming from somewhere else. It is part of a uh, deficit in the cities. And this is not just something that, that's a problem of, of, uh, of Zurich or of, of uh, Germany. It's also something that actually has a global dimension. You can see here one example by The Economist. They titled in 2015, when building Chinese cities, someone forgot the drains. And it seems that uh, such events are kind of something that happens about every year once again, not because the rivers are overflowing, but because the cities are built so fast that the drainage system is completely overwhelmed. And it's, not, it's also not just something for new cities, but also now all the cities because of the climate change, because of the, the densification of, of existing cities, they start to see this problem more, more frequent. Uh, Copenhagen, you know, the 2011, 150 millimeters of rain in two hours, that widespread uh, flooding <clears throat> that caused billions in damages. And actually, and there's where the exciting starts, uh, the thing begins. They started to adapt the city in order to, uh, to cope with this also in the future. And the key word I would like to introduce here and discuss a little bit is small blue-green infrastructure. Blue-green infrastructure is kind of the, the word there, but I would like to put out some emphasis on small because this makes them challenging. And the core concept is fairly easy. You reduce runoff, you slow down runoff with a lot of measures that usually are somewhat blue, uh, somewhat green, and usually decentralized. And the picture I would like to show is not very spectacular because that kind of characterizes a little bit. Here's where I work at the AirVac. We have here an infiltration swale. The rainwater is captured here and is allowed to infiltrate here. And in order to be able to use that, uh, we just built another structure on top of it. It's the smallness. These are these are not huge um, uh, project, but this is a plethora of small little thoughtful infrastructures that you disperse over the, over the city and the number of them make a difference. It's not the individual project that make a difference. Another example to show is the multifunctionality. That's kind of another very important aspect of this structure. What you can see here is playground that you have up here where, where it's built in a way that actually the, the water in strong rain events can uh, be captured, can be dammed and then released safely and controlled into the rest of the urban drainage system. And these systems, they function a few times per year um, there are some systems that only function every, you know, um, once every 10 years. So being able to use this space in, in different ways is, is a very important factor. And the keyword here, again, is multifunctionality. And the, and the third aspect I would like to show is also the integration with the grain infrastructure that, uh, that you have. So here there are different examples from the adaptation in Copenhagen. And one example you know pretty well is here the streets. Usually the streets are built with you know, the highest point in the middle so that the water can drain to the side where it then can flow off. If you have a cloud burst, this means all the water that can't be drained is actually directed towards the, the buildings and causes damages. Plus it also that endangers the most vulnerable people, the pedestrians here. And all you need to do is kind of adapt the streets in a way that during a cloud burst, the water is not direct towards the buildings, but it's actually using the street as a runoff, uh, uh, as a, as a runoff channel to actually direct this excess water out of the, out of the city. And a very nice example that uh, kind of um, makes it very li livable for me is this example from Rotterdam. They call it the uh, uh, roof field. So these are these roof gardens that they promote very strongly with this multifunctionality in 
mined. And you can see that's a picture actually from their website. And these this, uh, green roofs that provide, you know, well known to everybody, they're cooling, but they also promote biodiversity. They promote having a life quality, a social aspect of getting together on these roofs. And then what I'm interested in is, of course, this type of stormwater management that they uh, provide. They have storage space underneath of them. The water can be recycled for, uh, for toilet flushing, for example. And these roofs are often also smart where the, the uh, urban drainage people can actually control the level of the thing. So when a storm comes, they can drain that and provide storage space. And the key here is multifunctional blue-green urban infrastructures. We need to think in adding multiple values and not just creating you know, urban drainage structures or green structures or something. We need to start thinking and combining them because space is scarce. And uh, just to, to give you one other aspect, biodiversity, 30th of September 2020, there was the UN Summit on Biodiversity. And if you're going to look at the Global Biodiversity Outlook uh, 5 that was published a few weeks ago, pretty bleak outlook. But one recommendation they have is to make greater use of green infrastructure to promote urban biodiversity. And this multifunctionality is what I would like to plea here a little bit. I would like to um, plea that everybody, the architects, but also the engineers, give water the space and the attention it deserves. And especially water in cities for the future, uh, cities of the future, they demand a very high integrative approach because they need space and we need to utilize the space as efficient as possible. With that, I would like to end and pass it back to you. Thank you very much, Max. We, we used to be taught in schools of architecture that architecture is playing with light, but uh, you provide us proofs that it's also playing with, uh, with water. Please allow me to, to uh, address a question to you. It's a double question uh, related to small, blue and green. Uh, you, you, you present it. Who is the biggest, the greatest friend of uh, this kind of approach and who is the, the, the biggest enemy in your opinion or barrier? Let's start with the enemies. That's uh, mm -hmm. it's right now a little bit easier. I think it's just uh, uh, the enemy is all the different uh, things that, that our attention, that uh, takes away the attention from this, right? It's energy use, it's density, it's lack of, of housing. It's, so there's a lot of aspects that uh, many of, of the city planners and architects need to deal with. And water is just one of them and water becomes then a major attention if actually our cities flood. And then it mm -hmm. disappears for the next 20 years. It's usually not that big of a problem. And then it hits again. And I think this, this, this interrupted, this, this long-term thinking is one of the key aspects that drive it forward. I think the friend is exactly that, is a careful planning where you think about the needs that you have also in a long-term perspective. So not just let you overrun from the short-term perspective, which is very important, but also think about you know, what long-term you need and how to integrate that and then I think this is going to help you to promote a little bit more of the, of, of the, the sustainable um, uh, thinking that, that these cities so urgently require. Excellent. Thank you very much, Max. And please allow me to, to pass the, the screen back to Thomas and to his, uh, his guest. Let's take a deep breath and talk about air. Yeah. Thank you, Sherman. Thank you, Secretary General. It's, it's very nice to hear these remarks. I, I was very taken with Nadia's final slide um, because I think it recognizes a reality in the world, and that is that um, so many people will continue to build for themselves where they can, when they can, with whatever materials they can find. And I think acknowledging that and, and accommodating it is a, is a very uh, important path forward. And um, thank you, Max. I, I like the emphasis on small, which actually began with a guy from big. Um, I think when Cayuve started, he said, you know, no matter what scale, uh, small projects count. And that is absolutely true. Um, I've become an in instant expert on air. Um, and uh, 
I looked up uh, the constituents of what poisons our air in cities, uh, ozone, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, volatile organic compounds, particulates, sulfur dioxide, lead and mercury. Um, that happy list is uh, almost all of it, the result of combustion of fossil fuels and a few other things. But uh, it comes from automobiles, it comes from power plants, it comes from industrial processes, it comes from the things that we consume. And uh, it is both uh, compounded by and it compounds the atmospheric changes that we are going through. Uh, so it's what you would call an infernal spiral or uh, somehow a vicious circle, uh, something that is of grave concern to anyone who lives in large cities uh, and certainly now uh, an increasing factor, even in places uh, like uh, where Jörg Pendel lives in Innsbruck and the upper atmosphere of our, of our planet. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Jörg is uh, from Austria. He is an architect. He is serving now his second term as president of the Architects Council of Europe, uh, one of our partners uh, earlier um, in this administration with a wonderful program on design competitions and improving the quality of building. Jörg, I'm going to turn the session over to you to talk about air, a subject dear to your heart, I know. Thank you. You have to unmute your microphone, Georg, please. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Actually, it's, it's very honorable that you are calling me an expert on air. I'm, I'm not sure if there is a certain irony or if, there is <laughs> or if you expect competence, which actually I'm not that much sure about. I, I just tell some thoughts I have on the issue. I think that air has a, a unique advantage because it's one of the few, let's say, things on earth which are not tried to be sold, like, for example, water. Already several companies filling water in not only bottles but tanks and selling it away. And uh, so if I hear about, which is very important to say that, that it's a human right to have a living, to have a housing space, to live somewhere inside, not in a tent only. Uh, there is also, of course, a human right to have water. Ex public access to the basic uh, things is an uh, absolute need, and water is one of them. So this, this development of, of bottling waters, water in, is, is outrageous. Luckily, in air, this is not yet developed. Perhaps it's, it's, it's coming later. On the other hand, I, I have uh, only my personal thinking about this air quality issue is, uh, it, of course, not looking now to the atmosphere, but uh, looking to the construction uh, field. I think that uh, I am not a fan of the nowadays uh, attitude to make people breathe through tubes. I think we should a bit more go back to basics. We should be able to open the windows, which is still the case mostly, but uh, actually, at least in Europe, the regulations are developing in a way that you might be even obliged to uh, let people breathe through tubes, which in my personal opinion is, is uh, something terrible. Well, I'm living in a place where you just go out and, uh, and climb for half an hour and you have a wonderful air quality, it's easy to say, but uh, still I'm, I'm not convinced about of this, of this technical um, development. And so to make a bit of sidestep, I would like to mention the speech of Ursula van der Leyen, which she has held recently in the parliament and where she has put a bit a different, I mean, in my view, a bit a different way of thinking because actually normally the commission where she is now the president as a very technical, let's say, mechanical, technical approach. And she actually uh, quoted, said, I, I quote, um, the next generation EU to kickstart a European renovation wave and make our union, Europe, a leader in the circular economy. But this is not just an environmental or economic project. It needs to be a new cultural project for Europe. And this, I think, is very important because uh, everything what, what concerns building, the construction sector, as it's wonderfully called, I don't like the term 
uh, is mostly dominated by, by technical issues, let's say, like this. And this is the culture has no role, and quality of architecture has no role in that. And even looking at the renovation of the European building stock, it's a, it's a real threat to hear what is, what is coming up by this technological approach. And she proposes this is why we will set up a new European Bauhaus, a nice term, a co-creation space where architects, artists, students, engineers, designers work together. And this I find quite remarkable as it opens a chance to step in and say, yes, we are called in the first line, the architects are nominated in this list. And so this is a, I think we should try to take the opportunity to say, yes, this is a wonderful concept and we work on it. Actually today I have, we shall send a letter also to you, Thomas, and to Serban, inviting you to have some common thoughts about this uh, about this initiative. Well, we'll welcome that. Not air, but <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, I would make two remarks. Uh, one, uh, we included air as a factor for the very reason you mentioned in the importance of outdoor air in our interior environments. As we approach this pandemic uh, as a profession, it is becoming increasingly clear that the propagation of aerosolized particles are a big part of transmission of this disease. And uh, in closed environments where you're recirculating air that humans have, have breathed and are expelling is a very difficult uh, thing in this pandemic. And I think it's so important that we emphasize the quality of indoor air and the exchange of air with the outdoors as part of what we need to work on. The second point uh, is that I think certainly more than ever before in my lifetime, we are seeing commitments from political leadership to move away from the internal combustion engine, away from single uh, use automobiles powered by gasoline or diesel engines and toward a future that involves multimodal, multi uh, technical approaches. Uh, Paris has made serious commitments now uh, to moving away from the automobile. As you may have learned, the state of California has just adopted uh, a, a regulation that will prevent the sale of gasoline and diesel powered automobiles in the relatively near future. And I think we're seeing a transition in cities away from uh, these systems that are so reliant on, on uh, internal combustion. Uh, we're seeing also a movement in our construction industry away from materials that involve volatile organic compounds. We're seeing the manufacturers of these things move away from technologies that are based on this. And it all has to do with this fundamental human right you mentioned, access to clean air. Um, and it's such an important element. We did not want to keep it off the agenda. I invite a final comment from you and anyone else on our panel who wishes to offer a comment. Otherwise, we're going to move forward and with thanks to you, Georg. Thank you. It's fine. <laughs> okay, thank you, Georg. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, and please let me follow the agenda and invite the next uh, speaker who is going to address the design of uh, public spaces. And uh, let me introduce you Mr. Joseph Kwan, who is a regional director from Region 4 from UIA a Work Program Architecture for All, which is a very successful program because it deals with very important things. Architecture for All, Regional Director Joseph Kwan is current uh, Rehabilitation International Deputy Vice President for Asia Pacific, former UIA Council Member for Region 4 in between 2005 and 2008, an expert consultant to the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia Pacific and to the Asian Development Bank. He's an architect and consultant with experience in the built environment, transportation and inclusive tourism since 1987. Joseph, you are quite quick. The, the screen is yours already and waiting for your input. Please. <laughs> uh, you have to unmute your microphone. Joseph, please, we can't hear you yet. I hope you can hear me, Joseph. Uh, yes, I can. You okay great. now? Yes. Can you see my, my slides? Everything. Well, 
thank you very much for the UIA uh, President Thomas and, and Chauvin for inviting our work program to be part of this World Architecture Day. It certainly is, a, is an honor for us to be included in this, this very important event. And I would like to share with our, with our friends, our architects, um, in the design of public spaces, in the, the eyes of the Architecture for All program. As we know, Architecture for All is a program started off back in 1999 in Beijing uh, with President Vasilis. He suggests that we should have something like that. In those days, it was called Architecture for the Disabled. But over the years, we've evolved to be Architecture for All, which basically meant uh, we work from the almost like the, the human, the sociology aspect of designing from the user, which is we'll come to in a minute. And my quick presentation will cover a number of the things, uh, definitions, etc. What are the importance architectural determinants in the design of public spaces, which we as architects are very privileged to be part, part, part of. And I will show some examples and eventually some of our awards and, and eventually the future of, uh, of the work program and future work maybe from UIA. Look at the definition. Greek work, agora, all right? It's an open space as for assembly, places for commercial, civic, social, or religious activities. It's interesting under the definition, or, or already mentioned, it's going to be open and accessible to people. I'm sure the word accessible is not the one that we, as working with the disability world, accessible meaning accessible to people with disabilities. So at least the word is in there. I hope we're going to get more and more used to this word. Accessibility, accessible is meant to be more for everybody, including people with disabilities. And including this part of the Agora, we talk about roads, public spaces, squares, and, and beaches that are considered as a public space. And eventually, I would like to mention the concept of shared spaces, uh, which are, I believe is the direction we'll be heading, which I'd like to hear some of your comments uh, in the discussion about this the shared space aspect. The, the design of public spaces are these physical dimensions, are the social aspects, psychological, political. And I think currently we're really dealing with a new one, I think we mentioned already, the health and well-being aspect. How do we design nowadays public open spaces for health and well-being? We hear so much about people homestay, they want to get out, get some fresh air, and then go to public spaces. There are certain limitations now. Um, so I think there's there's a, a real need for us to look at what is going to be the future of this post-COVID uh, design. The other dimension I have to mention is the age and ability. Age in our, in our, in our very much um, our work program, meaning an age group from designing for the very young families, adults, fit and healthy, and the elderly. And ability means people with different abilities. We're not the same. We all have different abilities. We also may have different disabilities. So I certainly in, in the design of public spaces, these are the things we must look into as well. Certain characteristics, um, I'm sure I'm speaking to a, a group of professional architects, you know all of this. Uh, the one I'd like to mention more so is probably the intangible functionality. What, what, what I mean by intangible aspect and the bottom line is we need to design open spaces that are inclusive. I think that's the way we're, more in getting more and more into a safe environment, equitable environment and accessible environment. I mean, any open spaces, internal and external must include these uh, qualities and characteristics. The intangible aspects I like to mention are things, it's hard to define as such. That's why the intangible, you know, how do we design a quality public space with certain richness, which it's memorable, which provide us with experience all these spaces could be very monumental. You may have a historical background. It certainly could be part of our culture. And it also be very symbolic. And finally, touristic. I think we go to places because it's, we know it's nice and we go to big plazas and squares, whatever big and small, because of various uh, aspects of this, this part of tourism, if you like. Um, these um, international determinants, very one we're actually working with is probably the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This came into force in 2008. Basically, the convention prohibits discrimination and various articles, there are about 30 articles. Article two talks about universal design. Article nine already talks about accessibility. 
And Article 30 talks about participation in cultural life, recreation, leisure and sports, which certainly very much enmesh into what we're talking about, design of a, of a public space. This one, I think um, Ish will no, no doubt we speak about. We're we'll hearing more, more about the 2030 agenda. Of course, the one that really affects us, influences us the most is probably goal, goal 11, to make our cities and human settlement, which includes public spaces, those keywords again, inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Now I go to these examples. We all recognize what these are. I'm sure these were designed with great architects with all those qualities I just mentioned, obviously. It's St. Peter's uh, Plaza. The red square, once again, has many, many functions. I think this multi-purpose aspect of this is what, what creates architecture, you know, the, the, uh, wonderful that we can create places which is multifunctional and multi-purpose. And this particular environment, the one on top, which is close to uh, where Tom is, um, of course, uh, Times Square, and at the bottom, the National Mall. Certainly open public spaces, various different functions, very symbolic, historical, entertainment, or touristic functions. And this is more into this, the circular approach. This is, to me, a, a very fine example of public space. It has a beautiful back, backdrop. You can see it has inclusive qualities. It can be used for open entertainment. It has the cultural aspect. It has the, the scenic tourist aspect. Yet it's also equally accessible and safe for everybody to use. So that's, to me, is, is a great example of what we're trying to achieve within our work program. In the linear aspect, we talked to those about the central center focal point. These are the linear design of, uh, of uh, urban public spaces. This is in Lisbon, obviously. And the space, the street itself is very lively. It's full of life. And it's, it's used as an excellent public space, not only for um, the tourists, but I'm sure the locals will equally enjoy, you know, the businesses, thriving businesses at street level. This is, once again, a prime example of architecture where it can have a combination of culture, uh, commercial, civic, residential, and a combination of everything We makes this bridge such a success. And I think architects uh, of various era can congratulate ourselves into, we can create some, something like this and we hope we can continue to create spaces, urban spaces like that. Once again, prime example of what is something which is internal, external, it's an iconic building, it's an iconic structure created by man, created architects, which certainly provides many, many functions uh, for the city of Milan. This final one I'd like to mention is, it's less monumental. It's, it's a link between St. Paul's Cathedral down this lane, if you like, called Peter's Hill from St. Paul's Cathedral all the way down towards the river, across the Millennium Bridge to Tate Modern. And this is a fine example of inclusive space where even though it's sloping down from St. Paul's down to the riverbank, river um, there are steps and there are integrated, very well, well integrated ramps, which works very well for everybody to, to be able to use. So if you have a chance to use that, you realize how successful that particular urban uh, public space is. Back to our work program, back in 2017, we we're very fortunate with the support of the UIA uh, Council to, to run this particular uh, inclusive and friendly spaces award in, in and it was, the winners were um, awarded at, uh, at the, the World Congress. At that time, there were four categories, obviously public space is one of them. Research is, is one. I believe our, our friend who's with us tonight, Madda, she won the, she was a winner of the research uh, of category. So once again, great, great to be, see you again and great that you're a winner of this particular category. We had a number of uh, entries from countries and continents. We're certainly uh, continuing this one. And then we, we were hoping to present the winning designs, the, win the winners at, the, at this conference, but it looks like that maybe has to be postponed, definitely postponed to, to, uh, to Rio next year. And the winners from the 2017 um, uh, awards were from uh, Puerto Rico, a nice little square from that. And two mentions, uh, one from Greece and the other one from my hometown where I am now, a, from Hong Kong, uh, reworking uh, a space, a linear space within an underpass of Hong Kong uh, under fly, flyover. So that was very successful. And we'd like to thank UIA for, for allowing us to promote this aspect in the work program. I'd like to share a bit more about the web program that we have a guideline 
on accessibility, inclusion, and this is now in, of course, in English, French, uh, Spanish, translated recently into Russian and Chinese. So we certainly welcome people to, 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 uh, to visit this website and get some ideas. What we're speaking of is accessibility and inclusion. We do not certainly want to exclude people, but we want our open spaces and touristic places to be inclusive of everybody. And how we do that? Taking a prime example from Norway, for instance, it's a national strategy, national policy that Norway will have a, have a political will to say they will be universally designed by 2025, which basically means public spaces, internal outdoor spaces, all those hopefully will be, and I look forward to, to the 2025 when we can see some fine examples out of Norway. New ISO uh, standard is, is under review at the moment. Um, that will come out in 2020. That's talk about accessibility and usability of the built environment. Of course, public spaces is certainly one of those aspects that we need to consider. Design for all schools. I think our students, uh, architecture students, even primary school or high school students should be at a very early stage be made aware of what we're trying to achieve, that we're looking for equality. We're trying to achieve um, accessibility, inclusion. I think from, from a very young age, very early age in architecture school, we should really be looking at into bringing that concept into, into the schools of the curriculum. Interesting, UN Habitat, they're looking at different aspects. This is the shared aspects of space where streets can be as a public space and it can be a driver for prosperity. And I think this may be the direction we will be looking into, apart from the traditional central linear aspect, how do we re rework some of existing environments into more uh, socially friendly uh, public spaces for all. And it's interesting, uh, the Institute here, World Resource Institute saying that they're looking at cities that are safe by design. As you see, of course, we are sharing spaces now. Uh, hopefully less cars in the city provide the where the cars used to be pedestrian or walkways, bicycle paths and, and everything in order to make this open space safe for everybody from the urban to street designs. The future, the challenges post COVID, we talk about socialization. We want to socialize. We talk about these open spaces. I, I think we, we need to rethink what is our new urban space, open space is gonna look like. And I'm sure I don't have all the answers. We have all the brains for it within UIA. Uh, let's work together. How do we deal with uh, the new post COVID era with good design of public spaces where maybe using good appropriate technology and looking at health considerations as well. Speaker earlier mentioned, I think Javoti mentioned about built back better and to leave no one behind. This is an aspect we need to look at as well in terms of public spaces. And this is an excellent example of, of course, in Nepal, excellent example of public space where it's got the culture, where it's got the religious aspect, and it's also used by the community. It is not just not the touristic site, of course, it's used by community every day. Uh, and it's a good combination, integration of all those quality aspects. But over a three-year period, 2016 to 2019, all that beautiful architecture has, was reduced to, to rubble. And that's where we've got to come back and say, we have to build back better. Uh, whether it's through structural engineering or different techniques, uh, we need to build back better. And the idea is we should not leave anyone behind, whether they're able or, or disabled. And this is what we're talking about, integration, inclusiveness, safety, uh, of public open spaces where everybody, families, ability, disability can use the space. And finally, this is what we speak of, inclusion as what we're trying to achieve. So thank you very much uh, for your time and attention. Thank you. We thank you very much, uh, Joseph. It was an excellent presentation and an excellent work of, uh, of this uh, work program of UIA. Uh, before uh, going to the next speaker, please allow me to provoke you with a subject. Uh, generally, when we uh, speak about indoor environments, about uh, buildings, uh, 
uh, we speak about capacities. Every room, every space uh, may allow a certain number of people and everything is, is uh, planned, uh, calculated, designed accordingly. So there are capacities of, of, of spaces. What about public space? What about numbers? What about big numbers of people in public space? Do you have a perspective on that? Can you give us some thoughts? The examples back there with St. Peter's, uh, Plaza, Piazza, and Red Square, all those were spaces where we pack people in and probably the part of the social experience, experience is to have a lot of people together. I mean, and but now I think the, the challenge is how do we do the same without, without removing some of those experiences uh, within this post-COVID uh, era? Um, obviously, uh, we calculate spaces, uh, de defining on safety aspects in internal buildings, evacuation routes, staircases, etc. In the outdoors, there may be a similar sort of thing that we need to consider, you know, in terms of evacuation, getting people out safely, etc. But um, I think it's the challenge is how do we make it equally enjoyable, a public space, without, without ruining it, without destroying mm -hmm. what we're trying to achieve uh, in terms of bringing people to, together, sharing an experience, sharing a, 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 a rock concert or something like that. And how do we do that? within this, this era, or do we abandon all that and, and uh, we're all masked, whatever. So I hope I answered you. That's a very difficult question, Chervain, but um, <laughs> I hope you answered some of your, your, your questions. Okay? Yes, Thank of you. course. Thank you. Thank you very much again, uh, Joseph. And uh, please allow me to go further. Uh, we cannot talk about uh, future without talking about education. So uh, I will invite to, for the next uh, presentation the two co-directors of the Education Commission. Uh, and please allow me to, to introduce them. Uh, Magda Mostafa is a co-director of Education Commission, uh, is an associate chair of the architecture department of the American University in Cairo, and design associate of progressive architects in Cairo too. She, she specializes in design for autism, and is the author of the Autism Aspects Design Guidelines, winner of the UIA International Research Award in 2014. And she designs globally and she has shaped autism projects in Europe, US, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and UIA. So this is Magda and please allow me to, to present before uh, giving you the, the, the screen, the other uh, co-director of our UIA Education Commission, who is Marilise Nekomeke co-director, she's an architect, professor of architecture and associate dean for strategic initiatives at Florida International University. Her professional and academic projects focused on urban resilience and on the design of sustainable affordable housing and infrastructure. They are included uh, in the archives of the US National Building Museum. They have been honored with over 40 design and research awards, national and international exhibition and wide publication the National Science Foundation, National Endowment for the Arts, the US Department of Energy, US Conference of Mayors and International Architecture Biennale in Rotterdam, as well the Andrew W. Mellon, Graham, Sintas and the American Architecture Foundations have all supported her research and creative work. She's a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and the Distinguished Professor of the Association of Collegiate School of Architecture, ACSA. Thank you very much to both of you. I don't know how are you going to share uh, your presentation, but it's up to you. Uh, Magda Merilis, the screen is yours. Thank you, Sherban. Uh, I'll just introduce first some broad guidelines and then um, I'll invite Merilis to join you with her thoughts as well. So this is a big topic, um, as Sherban mentioned in his introduction, to build a better future, we need to build better future architects. And that is the mission statement of uh, the two groups that Marilisa and I come to you to represent today. The first is the Education Commission and also our Validation Council. And here on the screen, we have a number of our uh, vision and mission statements, but rather than divulge into these platitudes and conceptual terminologies, I think it's best just to focus on uh, the core values that both of these groups uh, 
focus on and revolve around. And one of the things that we're very proud of at the Education Commission, and I think that distinguishes the UIA's Education Commission and Validation Council from similar institutions and bodies all over the world, is that diversity and inclusion that we see. And it's, it's fortunate that we were scheduled right after Joseph spoke, because we also believe in education, how important inclusion and diversity is not just because that's a human value we need to uphold, but also because there are perspectives and real academic uh, views and, and, and viewpoints that can be brought to the table when we think about our architectural global challenges from these different lenses. So we see our group uh, as a diverse and inclusive group. We have representations from all five regions. We validate schools across the globe. We convene and curate conversations around these global challenges. And one of the important things we do is bring regional lenses to these global challenges. So the impact of climate, for example, the importance of these regional lenses is that these challenges mean different things in different parts of the world. So global challenges manifest themselves uh, in different ways. Uh, it can be the flooding that we saw in Max's presentation or desertification and the drying out of other parts of the world. And the architectural response to these two poles of the same problem or two sides of the same coin, there are lessons to be learned from both of those perspectives. So these regional lenses to us in Education Commission is very important. We also focus through the Commission on celebrating different modes of practice from the very local handmade back to basics as Georg mentioned. Uh, the value of looking at different regional practices in education uh, from around the world, from passive, low-cost, handmade vernaculars, all the way to these hyper-technical, AI-informed, responsive architectures. There's so much that we can learn as a commission across uh, the different regions that we're responsible for. And another thing that we like to engage in in thinking about the future of architecture is to work with our colleagues in professional practice and look at education and professional practice rather than two separate entities that are often seen with a barrier between them, but to try and integrate and work across uh, that barrier and see more of an integration between education and practice. And just the other day, and, and um, just coincidentally, it's actually running in parallel to our webinar uh, right now. Just the other day, I was in a conversation with uh, the director of the Mies van der Rohe Foundation in Barcelona, our friend and colleague Ana Ramos, around this idea and this, uh, and Georg joined me in that conversation. And the question that was posed to us was how can we combat through education this hyper practicality that the practice of architecture now demands of our graduates? And why is it that our graduates often choose not to practice architecture and go into more socially conscious, socially driven, humanistic disciplines like advocacy and so on and so forth. And our response, or at least the Education Commission's response to that is that we have a responsibility to educate architects that can do both. And we don't see these two agendas as mutually exclusive. To be professionally proficient should not be seen as separate from being socially conscious. So those are all among the values that we believe in in the Education Commission. And there are two very uh, discrete tools that through which we achieve these um, objectives that Marilisa is going to talk to you about. The first is the inaugural award for architectural education and innovation in architectural education that we launched this year and that we hope to, to be receiving entries for within this next week. So unfortunately, we don't have any images of, of any entries or winners to show to you, but we hope to be able to share them soon. And also um, our validation council and the network of schools that we validate across the globe. So I will hand this over to Marilise. Okay. Thank you, Magda. Um, thank you, Sirban, uh, Thomas, and colleagues. This is an exceptional event. Um, I wonder, Magda, yeah, we could stay there just for a moment. Um, as Magda very eloquently introduced the work of our Education Commission and um, our um, UNESCO UIA Validation Council on architectural education. Um, we have worked through a number of instruments um, to meet the goals of the commission and council to respond to its core values, um, to meet its mission and, and um, 
come up to the, the vision that it has for the role that it can play um, in the training and the inspiration as well as education of young architects. Um, the first of this, these is the inaugural UIA Award for Innovation in Architecture Education. Um, we believe that meaningful action obviously begins with knowledge and this UIA Award um, is intended to recognize excellence in architectural and urban design education. We want to focus on innovative pedagogies to foster the development of resilient, responsive, sustainable environments across the five UIA regions, uh, while actually uh, in very specific ways reflecting the diversity among those five regions. We are looking at an award that um, focuses on pedagogy and on curricula rather than on specifically inventive unique designs that it um, that celebrates an approach to emphasizing the role of architecture and urban design education in addressing all of the great societal and environmental challenges that we've been talking about today. Um, and those in specifically looking at response to the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We have an exceptional jury, a distinguished panel that represents all five of the UIA regions, um, and we hope to confer the inaugural awards at the Rio Congress. Um, we are, as Magda says, not yet in receipt of all of the entries. Those are due later this month in October. Um, but we hope very much to be able to um, host and generate a productive discussion around multiple ways of approaching these critical challenges. Um, we hope for uh, a group of young architects who are entering the profession with their aspirations and their hopes and their ideals critically on track and backed by the technical expertise that's required to make those visions a reality. Um, a second part of what we do is um, that we are a part of the UNESCO UIA Validation Council for Architectural Education. And what you see on the screen is a current uh, map shows where our validated programs are. And you'll see that they are in Africa, they are in Europe, they are in the Middle East, they are in Asia. Um, it is a group of schools that um, is growing. The UIA validation system was approved by the UIA Congress in Berlin in 2002. Um, and it has since been over the past 18 years growing its infrastructure um, and its outreach. Most recently, and this is a brand new announcement as of just last week, UNESCO UIA has been admitted as the provisional signatory of the Canberra Accord for Architectural Education. And the accord is a, a reciprocal recognition agreement among systems of architectural education worldwide for professional academic credentials. Uh, the new affiliation extends opportunities for students in our validated programs. It expands the outreach um, of the proponents of our own critical and exceptional core values, and those are inclusion, diversity, equity and access, dissemination and engagement, and excellence and transparency of processes for architectural education. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, both of you. And please allow me to, to uh, ask a question, uh, which obviously will relate on the current situation. What do you think is the impact on the academic education of the current situation, which sent students and professors in the online or in the, to different uh, methods. Do you have already a perspective? Can you tell us some of your feedback? Um, I can jump in very quickly just because this was a topic that we discussed the other day um, in that Ms. van der Rohe conversation, and I'm sure Melis mm -hmm. also has her own thoughts. But we have in, in architectural education for a long time talked about online and digital education and paperless studios that it has always been uh, a, an ongoing thought experiment that we have been engaged in. And then we were, as you said, Sir Ben, thrust into it virtually overnight. I think there's a lot of carryover benefits and challenges. I think one of the mistakes that we are seeing our colleagues do is to try and recreate 
the physical studio environment, but in a digital form. I think what we need to do is embrace more of the digitality and what we can do digitally that we can't do physically with our students. One of the benefits of this happening now is that the generation of students we're dealing with, I think around the world, um, are the digital generation. This is a group of uh, people who were born into the internet age, who are very comfortable with engaging and communicating in digital formats and, and platforms anyway. So it isn't a big stretch for them. I think more of the struggle is with the educators than with the students themselves. It has, however, particularly in the part of the world where I come from, highlighted um, the inequity and the um, socioeconomic gaps between those that have access to technology and have access to high speed internet and resources that they need to engage something as simple as not every student will have their own laptop at home or a computer it may be shared among a family they may not have an internet connection that's available or connected so it has just exacerbated these gaps that we already knew existed that schools were able to provide resources for but that suddenly students are, are have found that they have to fend for themselves and just one final thought i i i hope that our colleagues um uh, in the, the Sustainable Development Goals group who will be speaking shortly, we'll be able to come up with some sort of metric of the, the carbon footprint reduction as a result of, and in the different sectors, but at least in education where large groups of people are no longer commuting um, to campuses the same as for every other sector. But there's a real measurable uh, decrease in our carbon footprint as a, as a result of, of this experiment that I think we would benefit from carrying forward. Very interesting uh, approach, Magda. Thank you very much. Marilis, would you like to build on? I would be happy to. I think Magda did a wonderful job. Um, I, I will say that my own university is in fact tracking um, the, different, the difference in the carbon footprint on our own campus. And um, my university is actually quite large. There are over 60,000 students and, and the distinct difference um, between the post-COVID environment and uh, the pre-COVID environment is extraordinary. Um, I will say that um, with respect to the pivot to online learning, while it has highlighted um, difficulties that are um, financial and technical and has posed some obstacles to access. Um, it has also opened avenues to greater connectivity. We find that our students and our colleagues have access to um, the voices and opinions of educators and students from around the world in a way that was not previously um, possible. So we have um, voices worldwide coming to our design discussions, becoming a part of our lecture series. Um, and we have new relationships blossoming, a whole entire network um, that now exists as a result of the pivot to online learning. Um, we at the Education Commission have had a number of conversations across the Commission and the Council and with RIBA, who is our system operator, on ways of continuing our work in validation virtually. And we will be holding our very first virtual validation visit now in November. Again, the number of participants is um, quite international. The cost to the school has actually been reduced. Um, and mm. so again, we, we are talking about opportunities for excuse me, expanded access um, in some ways while again highlighting critical gaps in others. Um, I think that the subject matter of discussion um, now includes public health. It looks, it includes new looks at potentially the urban penalties of, of um, density and ways to mitigate those. Um, uh, I think that the conversation has been deepened and expanded across our universities as it has been across our profession. Um, we are very interested in being part of this moment in time and really are honored and appreciative of the opportunity to engage in this conversation. Fantastic, uh, Marilis. I would call this uh, optimistic academic resilience. Uh, 
which is happening now. Thank you very much, both of you, for your, your input. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure we are going to talk a lot about this in the future time, being part of these times. And I will pass to, to the next um, couple of co-directors of another UIA commission, which we simply call the SDG Commission. You may guess for, uh, where SDG comes from. And please allow me to introduce both of them and then to, to listen in, uh, in the reverse order of my presentation, their uh, inputs. So I'm starting with uh, Natalie Mosin, which is a co-director of UIA Sustainable Development Goal Commissions. She's coming from, from Denmark, from Copenhagen. Natalie specializes in the interaction between architecture, building technology, and society. As a former chair of the Danish Association of Architects and um, council member of the UIA, Natalie's leading voice is a leading voice in setting the agenda for sustainable development uh, at both a, a strategic and a political level. She's also head of the Institute of Architecture and Technology in Copenhagen School of Architecture and the president of uh, the, the next World Capital, uh, World Congress uh, uh, of Architecture of UIA in Copenhagen. Thank you, Natalie, for being here. And please allow me to introduce your, your colleague and partner and at the SDG, which is Ishtiak Zahir Titas. We all uh, call Ish. Uh, he's the co-director again of the, this uh, UIA Sustainable Development Goal Commission. Ishtiak is uh, Han Faya and the co-founder of VITI, an international recognized architecture and urban design practice in Bangladesh. So he's coming from Bangladesh, obviously. He's former chair of Arcasia Committee for Professional Practice. He's currently council member for UIA Region 4. He believes that sustainability should be the, at the core of all development works and architecture should focus more on research and innovation. And he's fantastically active. So Ish, I sh uh, give you the, the, the screen to you. Please share the screen and make your, your presentation. You should unmute your microphone, Ish, please, to allow us. Thank you, Sherman. Uh, That's fine. Thank you for your nice introduction uh, to our SDG Commission. And I hope you can see my screen and hear me well. Both of them. Yeah. So, I think uh, we have our fantastic panels uh, talked about most of the key issues of SDG goal number 11. And uh, I'm gonna cover uh, the advocacy part and what we are gonna do in the next decade of action. So thank you UIA for giving uh, our SDG commission this opportunity. Uh, dear guests, invited speakers, architects, urban professionals and UIA partners, and stakeholders present here today, and my friends and colleagues of UI around the globe. Assalamu alaikum, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. I'm architect Shtiak, architect from Bangladesh, and representing our UI commission as co-director. Today, I feel privileged to speak in front of this global audience. We, as an architect, we interact with each of the 17 SDG goals through design and realizing the project. UIA recognized built environment is part of the problem, but through the potential quality design practice, it is also the part of the crucial part of the solution. So UIA SDG Commission endorsed the 17 SDG goal and we pledge to achieve carbon neutrality into our communities and building. This presentation will guide you to make it tangible how the built environment interacts with goals, in particular goal number 11, engaging architects and urban professionals. We have seen a very good example from Nadia's presentation, Max, George, Joseph. So uh, I will not go through and repeat those, but I'm trying to engage how we are going to, as an architect, has to be engaged into this uh, uh, SDG 
goal number 11 and SDG. This is an image, I quite like it and I use it often, uh, prepared by uh, UN uh, Aroma Ravi, and it shows by 2030 what will happen to us. We have the 5 million people and $90 trillion is required to handle the uh, challenges. So since 1976, the urban population has increased 20%. And today, 55% approximately population lives in the cities that occupy only 2% of the land. As you can see the dots, these are mostly concentrated in our region in South Asia and mostly Asia and a big number in Europe and then into Americas. So these are the big challenges and we have to resolve for another 2 billion more people will be living in the urban areas and for the housing by 2030. So this, is, this creates an unprecedented challenge to the world and we have to deal with it. And how do you do it? In 2015, all countries agreed to play with numbers. We got 17 SDG goals. And these goals aims to promote the livelihood of all the people in everywhere, leaving no one behind, leaving no place behind, meaning reducing the inequalities among the countries. And this is very important. We have 10 years to go, already five years already gone, and we have 169 targets and 230 indicators. Uh, have a look at uh, what goal number 11 says. I'm going to read this out. Uh, make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, productive, resilient, and sustainable. We all know this, but we have to reiterate. It means ensuring access to safe, affordable housing and upgrading slum settlements that we discussed, uh, uh, covered by Nadia. And also, involves investment in public transport, creating green public space, Joseph has already uh, included, and improving design planning and management in a participatory and inclusive way. This is one of the important aspects we have to make people understand that we have to deal with it. Now, uh, goal number 11 has got a list of targets. I, I will briefly go through these targets. These all are these are, some people say these are impossible targets, but I think these are attainable if we all act together. 10 years is a short time, but it is achievable if we consider this as our uh, own uh, ownership. By 2030, uh, we ensured for everybody to have adequate, safe, and affordable housing that also we discussed today and sustainable transport system has to be accessible to everyone. That also Joseph has been mentioning. Uh, uh, by 2030, we enhance inclusive urbanization, participatory and sustainable human certain planning and management in all countries. This is very important. We cannot leave any other countries uh, away. So it has to be, we have to go together. And comes the culture and natural heritage. This is another aspect we should safeguard and protect. We want development, but we also protect our heritage and culture. We, we don't want to leave those behind. And uh, a very uh, important thing that uh, George has mentioned, uh, we talked about uh, air quality. This is a very big issue. Uh, by 2020, we need to reduce the adverse environmental impact of cities with special attention to air quality and waste management. Uh, then comes the provide universal access. Again, Joseph has repeatedly mentioned, I know Joseph has been working for this universal accessibility. And this is also with public space, the green space. It has to be inclusive, safe, and accessible. I know there are uh, cities around the world as uh, challenges to uh, come up with uh, uh, public spaces and green spaces. And uh, rightfully mentioned that the uh, street can also become where the spaces are not there, street can become a public space. Then come the support, uh, very, very important aspect. This is then we are talking about urban, urban and urban. So what about the rural areas? So we, we considered that if there should be a positive economic, social and environmental links between urban, peri-urban and 
rural areas. So we just cannot leave the rural areas. So it has to be a linked. So there's urban, urban rural linkage is very, very important. And then comes the adaptation of climate change, resilience to disaster and disaster risk management at all level. Architect has to play a very important role in this regard. Now, in the present war, present day, to achieve SDG and the goal number 11. So we consider that cities must be well-designed and well-managed, well-planned and well-governed. Cities are there for the future as they will help address issues related to poverty, social exclusion, spatial inequality, climate and environment and various forms of crisis like epidemic. Uh, from our SDG Commission, we published a book uh, last year uh, and uh, Natalie, my co-director, will speak about it later on, how an architect can be engaged into all aspects of this poverty to all the 17 SDG goals. So as an architect, uh, we have to act on this first. All these things were adopted in new urban agenda and UI has been uh, one of the contributor to new urban agenda. New urban agenda is the, uh, is the key uh, document through which we can uh, uh, implement the goal number 11. So what can we do to attain a sustainable city? Uh, time is short, so I, I prepared a small video uh, for you to go through. It's a one minute video. Let's see whether it, it plays or not. Yeah, I think, I think it goes. A sustainable city is affordable and equitable. There's an example from London. A sustainable city is a healthy city. Porto Alegre, one of the most greener city in Brazil. Singapore, an example of sustainable as a safe city. A sustainable city is socially inclusive and poor, no segregation and exclusion. Bogota is an example of well planned, walkable, and transit friendly city. Copenhagen, a sustainable city best when it adopts carbon neutrality. A sustainable city best address any urban crisis. Bangladesh adopted all the Rohingya refugees and the compact city in Mexico. These are the key aspects we can consider as a sustainable city. Now it's 2020 and we got COVID-19. COVID-19, I believe this pandemic situation will have a long-term positive impact on the global mindset of the people and the policymaker. That will be beneficial to accelerate the implementation of SDG goal. This pandemic crisis is affecting cities. We have to reshape our cities so that we can mitigate any adverse situation along with goal number 11. And now is the time. As you can see, the public health influencing major shift in urban area and urban planning and design. This has been an historic, from, from the picture on the left side, this is the Black Death in 1350, influenced the cities of the city design in London, England. And next comes 1484, the Milan uh, Plague, where the Leonardo da Vinci had designed cities. And then uh, what we see our recent Paris, the broad walkways, broad uh, streets. These are the resultant of uh, during the cholera pandemic in 1832, Hasman renovation of Paris. So pandemic, public health always has a big impact on the cities. So COVID-19 in 2020 will make a change for everybody. And we take as a positive note and move forward. So what do we do to build the, better future within the next decade by 2030. I think it is an uh, opportunity. So we have to take an active interest in the governance and management of our cities, advocate for the kind of city you believe you need as an architect, develop a vision for your building, straight neighborhood and act on that 
vision. Uh, architects have much more greater responsibility and also the ability to do more. We have seen all the examples from our previous speakers. Uh, uh, architects are already on the go and we are working. And these are some uh, examples what we are gonna do in, in next, in future. On the left, this is an image of UN 17 village in the first building project in the world that translate all 17 SDG goals in Copenhagen by architect ledger group. And then comes, this is an example from UK. This is the first affordable ecological co-housing project designed by White Design is called Lilac, low impact living affordable community. These are already in working place. And then comes an example from by a uh, Spanish architect, Goulart, uh, is winning design of self-sufficient post-COVID city in China. So we are already in track and trying to make changes and look forward and look for the future, the future of the future of future of. As an architect, researcher, academician, to make a better future and build better, we have to share our collective knowledge, expertise, and wisdom. Then work cross-discipline and cross-jurisdiction, embrace innovation, and break down compartmentalized approaches that create barrier. Then we take responsibility for building consensus and very magnifying the community voice. We as an architect act ethically, responsibly, and transparently. We have to act together with our partner and stakeholder. Speaking with one voice on areas of agreement and to work together to make tangible commitments supportive to new urban agenda. New urban agenda is a document with uh, 162 uh, points that actually sh will shape our city. Last two years, we have been working with UN Habitat, all the stakeholders, including UIA uh, and urban professionals, and we prepared a driver of change for next three years. So we have 10 years time to implement these uh, SDG goals and specifically the goal number 11. And we got four drivers decided that we need to implement by uh, within the next three years and architects gonna follow that and as a professional and urban professional. It's like reduce spatial inequality and poverty in communities across the urban rural continuum, enhance shared prosperity of cities and region, strengthen climate action and improve urban environment, effective urban crisis and prevention. I hope uh, my colleague Natalie will uh, explain more uh, through some projects in uh, uh, next. My last slide, I uh, as an UIA, uh, SDG Commission, uh, we truly believe and it, it truly matters how people build, where and what cost for people and the environment in the name of uh, uh, building better future for us. So you are a place to hold this goal at the core of our action to build better cities for the benefit of all people while conserving our resources and using them wisely with shared knowledge and wisdom. Thank you very much. I, I ask uh, my colleague, Natalie, to... Uh, thank you, thank you very much, you very much. Uh, Before that, uh, Natalie, please allow me to address a question to Ish. Uh, what do you think about the race for urbanization? Will it slow down a little bit or on the contrary after the COVID uh, situation? Uh, uh, let me tell you one thing. There's been UI has been uh, heavily involved through World Art One Forum, World Art One Campaign, and Habitat Three process. And everybody, every time, it was very difficult uh, to make our policymakers, especially member state, to understand, make them understand that this is required. Climate change is required, and SDG goal must be achieved. Now, due to this COVID uh, uh, nineteen issues, I think. The policymakers will take it very serious as a serious note 
and they will listen to urban professionals. They will listen to us and make the implementation process in a, in a faster way. So I think this is a uh, blessing in disguise for urban professional architects and the uh, SDG. Thank you. Thank you, Ish. I, I totally agree. Natalie, please take the floor and uh, take us to the, to the guide. <laughs> but, uh, and thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of the, this event and even to be the last speaker before the uh, Q&A. But uh, I just one question to you, Seven, before I start, because I see at the clock that we are encroaching on the time left for the Q&A. Uh, should I, uh, rather than speak uh, 10 minutes, because I could speak 10 minutes as planned, I could speak for a long time, but I can also speak shorter. Should I try to make it a bit uh, shorter um, for the sake of the Q&A? Yes, but not very much, because it's a big work there and we want to hear you. <laughs> thank you so much, Seven. Thank you for that, um, Natalie. <laughs> So it's a pleasure today uh, uh, to launch uh, the second volume of an architecture guide to the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, in the, and I'll just uh, go to the next slide here. Let's see if it moves. Um, it's uh, in in the SG Commission. We have uh, we have had an interest in in uh, trying to support the conversation about architecture's impact over the goals, in showing realized work so that we have a real architecture with a real effect to discuss when we find out how to take those next steps towards more humane and more, more environmentally sustainable uh, built environment. So uh, today I'll just briefly introduce uh, the next volume uh, of the source book of the guide that we produced uh, for the first time in 2018. And then if time allows, I'll just super briefly show uh, a select handful of projects um, from uh, the new book that shows possible routes towards a specifically today's theme, a better urban future. But, uh, but I'll make it brief and you can, uh, those who are interested can follow up by downloading uh, uh, the whole uh, book later. It will be available on the UIA website. So just to sort of start, uh, I think maybe a little bit where we started today with the, the first speakers, some of the findings from our research and from uh, our work with these real examples is that architecture truly interacts with all 17 goals. It's uh, certainly uh, SDG number 11, sustainable cities and communities, but it's really all of them because the goals are connected and architecture, the built environment is truly connected to the role uh, of the uh, human endeavor and to uh, the, the health of our ecosystems. Another key finding that is truly heartening is that you can reach for the goals, you can contribute as an architect, regardless of where you are. As Marta was saying, we work under very different circumstances. Our role in the industry gives us very different platforms and our budgets from project to project are very uh, different, but there is a chance in all our work to strive to make a contribution, to make it a little bit better, a little bit more inclusive, a little bit less harmful to the environment. And certainly uh, this comes in all scales, in all forms, and in all materials. Uh, this, is the, um, this is an overview of the projects selected uh, for the second volume. And uh, as you can see, there are lots of wonderful projects from all over the world, but, uh, but this is, will serve as an appetizer and as also as a heartening, again, image of the fact that this is just some of the projects. There are so many more. This is happening everywhere in the world and the architects are contributing. So this is also an overview of the content of the, of the second volume of the book that we are launching today. But nevertheless, uh, and this echoes what, what Victor was saying in the beginning of, the, of today's uh, webinar, when we look at the new UNPP estimate for global human development, they are on course to decline this year for the first time since the concept was developed in 1990. It's a decline that's expected across the majority of countries, rich and poor, in every region. The World Bank has warned that the virus could push between 40 to 60 million into extreme poverty this year, with Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia hardest hit. And the World Food Programme says that an estimated 265 million people 
will face crisis levels of hunger unless direct action is taken. So the urgency for which to work for humane and environmental sustainability is bigger than ever. And they are certainly entwined. We cannot solve the one without solving the other. Um, and this comes again back to what both each and a number of speakers have addressed, that we must do this together. We must leave no one behind. This was also beautifully addressed in the, in the, the earlier commission's um, presentations. We must leave no one behind and we must reach those voters behind first. When the UN look at, um, at those at risk of being left behind, it is, as has been mentioned earlier, people who are poor, it's people with physical disabilities or mental disabilities, it's children and youth, it's elderly people, it's minority, it's people who, uh, it's uh, gender-based, it's based on religion, it's based on ethnicity. There are a lot of uh, fellow uh, human um, beings in this world who are at risk of being left behind. In this uh, space, in this webinar, we have the power to reach out to our uh, fellow citizens in each and every one of our projects, and we have a responsibility to do so. It can be, as Marta was mentioning, it can be remembering the children at risk when we build a school. It can be to remember um, the uh, employee who, who would not be able to uh, enter the workplace uh, if there are stairs at the, at the front door. Or it could, it could be to make uh, women uh, able to go to work by creating a safe streetscape to go through, to enter that workplace, to enter the, the work market. Um, as uh, the global pandemic devastates our health and the economy, we must acknowledge again that those furthest behind suffer the greatest consequences yet again. Um, so, uh, so the few selected projects that I'll just mention very briefly, they uh, collectively show possible routes toward a better urban future also during and post COVID-19, because I really believe as several uh, of the speakers mentioned, that a lot of what we already know about sustainable architecture, uh, about uh, humane and environmental sustainability uh, can be applied also in this situation. And that really, uh, we might even, as um, we heard earlier, uh, the effect of the floods on, on innovation uh, when it comes to rainwater, we could hope that this urgency learns us to respect some of what we already knew about uh, the unsustainability of informal settlements, of no access to sanitation and so on. So uh, to aim for, uh, when we aim to uh, establish safe and healthy dwellings in dense urban areas, also for people with limited resources, we have to look at strategies that include establishing access to sanitation, clean water and alternative food supply, planning tools, concepts, or open source infrastructure, flexible design, construction that you can add to yourself, the local and low cost materials, and the creating safe public spaces and functions for everyone, including, again, the most vulnerable. And now to just, uh, and this will be a little too briefly, but, the, but it would be such a shame not to have a, a, the debate in this event, but I'll just briefly show uh, five projects and then I hope that, uh, that we can have a deeper discussion at some other time and that you will engage with the uh, published material. So one a great example uh, is uh, this settlement from Kenya where, um, and it's tackling the hard challenge of trying to balance uh, the plight of refugees with the plight of the host community because quite often we have um, a, a very vulnerable uh, refugee population, but we often also have a vulnerable population that becomes a host of the migrants. This project contributes by creating an urban development that accommodates and try to uh, support uh, both the host um, community and the um, migrants, the refugees. And I'll leave it uh, uh, for later for you to dive into the project. This uh, project, uh, and I think many of you have probably seen this wonderful project before, but this wonderful project from South Africa, the Empower Shack Housing Project, combines a, a number of, uh, of um, tools. It's microfinancing, it's a, 
uh, open source digital planning tool. It's um, a structure that allows for uh, public space, functional public space, uh, the, the sort of partitions between the house ensure that fire can be contained. And at the same time, it allows individual family to uh, build and to develop uh, the house as the resources becomes available and as the family itself develops. And I'll move fast, fast forward, although these projects deserve so much more. Here it's the Star, Star Home project in Tanzania. It's a research project that, that brings together architectural researchers and, uh, and doctors um, building a uh, 100 experimental homes to, uh, to work with the design as a tool to combat the spread of dengue-borne diseases. So the buildings experiment with the level, uh, where is the level of the bedroom, uh, how far about the ground, uh, it's, it, it works with um, ventilation, natural ventilation, lightness of construction to, to um, keep the temperature down and, the, uh, and to sort of uh, avoid attracting the, the dengue. And it, it has uh, an amazing, uh, the early findings are amazing. Uh, close to 100% of, uh, of the dengue borne diseases are contracted indoors. And, uh, and if we can change the way uh, we design uh, the housing for middle class, working class people, uh, we can change uh, the spread of these uh, very serious diseases. Then there's this uh, project, Istiak, uh, that you brought me to see. It's in uh, uh, you and, uh, and your, your very talented wife and uh, the researchers and professionals in Bangladesh. This is a project of uh, in the refugee camps uh, at Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. And it shows really that you can do something of importance with no space and hardly any resource. Uh, the refugees in the camp cannot leave the camp. Uh, there's very little uh, square foot per person. And the food that is supplied is, uh, is dry food uh, supplied by the UN and other NGOs to, to help uh, the diet, it's very important to be able to grow vegetables. Those vegetables can also grow uh, up on the roof of the tent and help to create a better indoor climate. And you also have an activity that helps and empowers people in this situation to do something uh, to help sustain uh, their families and keep active. Many of the uh, refugees in the camps are former farmers and they have the skill and the know-how, but they need uh, to be allowed to keep it alive. These micro gardens, are basically based on the, on the nylon sacks that the dry, the dry food uh, comes in. Uh, and the, the, the genius here is simply to, uh, to give the soil and the seeds to each family. It's a small scale project with a great effect. And it, I think it learns us, it tells us something about that there's no place where we cannot make a meaningful difference. Uh, and the final, uh, project to show you today is uh, from Mozambique, the Habitat project that's working uh, in, a, in a very uh, holistic and sound way to create uh, land rights. So here the land right, the sort of legal work is combined with the development of public space uh, and, the, and the development of the, of the architectural quality, the housing quality for all the, the citizens. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, but simply, uh, uh, again, thank you all for, for being, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today, and I hope that some of you will take your time to look into this second volume uh, when published on the UIA homepage. Thank you very much. Natalie, thank you very much. I have a short question. I'm entering the debate with this. For you, uh, who do you foresee to be the readers of, of this guide? It's well, done for <laughs> whom? <laughs> well, um, when, when the idea first come up, the, the actually going, going back to the excellent uh, uh, lecture by, uh, by the Education com uh, Commission, the, our thoughts were with the students, that when we want students to engage with the UN 17 Sustainable Development mm -hmm. Goals and to think seriously about both the humane uh, sustainability and environmental sustainability, it's a good thing to both uh, um, present how the UN define each goal, but to link it with real projects. 
the student may not agree. These are not the only or the final examples, but then you have something to discuss, something real, something architectural that we can then uh, we can look at and say, oh, we could do something more. It should be different. I can put that into my design, or I can put something different into my design. But to start that conversation and that learning process, and then along the way in the in the in the commission and the, in our interaction with architects, we discovered that really. Uh, the book had a wider audience, also professionals, and uh, certainly also politicians and others uh, that that we need to engage in understanding the importance of architecture in this development. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. Thank you very much, both of you. Hurry up! I need your book in my your guide in my uh, university for the students. Uh, I'm looking to the Q&A uh, section and I thank, uh, thank all the, the panelists which already answered to the questions which were published there. Uh, please, if you have uh, questions from the audience, uh, just write them in the Q&A section. That is the place for uh, getting uh, the questions, but I, I see that uh, 11 questions were already answered. Uh, Hmm. Well, waiting for some more. In the meantime, uh, you can also <laughs> cross uh, question yourselves. Uh, yes, please, Natalie. Well, then I would like to mark that take the opportunity to engage with the question you raised uh, for the STP Commission on the uh, on the sort of the effect of the remote learning. What is the mm -hmm. outcome, uh, STP wise? And, and I think uh, the verdict is still out and it may also differ a little bit from different places in the world. I could say from my own university that um, if you have a campus where people can uh, come to the campus by bike and where you can uh, create resources, collect collective resources on campus that people can share, like tools, uh, um, computers, uh, robots, workshops, and you can uh, make those resources drive them on sustainable energy or make sure that they are that the uh, work environment is healthy and so on then I would say collective solutions meaning going to campus is a very uh, good and strong solution still but then in other places that may not be the case and the equation would come out differently but I wouldn't say that you could judge it uh, to either side and uh, and I would certainly say from my own university that we truly value when working with architecture to be able to build together. Uh, and uh, and I, I feel that being each of us in our screen, uh, in our home, um, is, is not the same as having shared resources where we uh, work together. Yeah, that's, that's sensitive. I think uh, first we have to come together to allow us to be apart. <laughs> There's no other way. Uh, so I see a question uh, f coming from Sherwin Ramosa. What are your thoughts on the issue of gentrification? Is there a danger of being too green or too blue? I think Max has already seen that. <laughs> what do you think? Or anybody else, of course. But Max was introducing the small green and blue. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the simple answer is I don't know. So what we do know <laughs> is that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, richer neighborhoods and uh, we, there's this really wonderful uh, investigation or analysis done in, in the US where they can show that uh, uh, neighborhoods that were classified as you know uh, high value worth to invest and uh, neighborhoods that were kind of classified as not worth the investment that the development in terms of blue green was very very different in the last few decades and you mm -hmm. have the consequences that uh, you now have rich neighborhoods that are very green that are have considerable lower summer temperature compared with these neighborhoods that were judged as uh, not you know worth the investment and and uh, therefore they were they were uh, developed very much poor what the cause and the effect is i don't really know the fact is the heat will be one of the big issues we have to deal with and we need to find ways to deal with heat and and shade green infrastructure is the only way to go you you know we can't put an ac in every every single building sure. on this globe mm -hmm. just not going to happen mm -hmm. and so i think we just don't have any choice i mean um 
we need to uh, provide relief from, from heat stress. It's killing people. It's not just bad air, but heat, if, if you reach 40 degrees, you have to go to work. It's just not sustainable. And so mm -hmm. we don't really have a choice. We need to go there. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Max. I'm reading from John Morley. So many small scale opportunities be uh, hindered by rigid town planning controls. What's the most effective way of interaction with municipalities for creation of special zones necessary to implement these great concepts? Who, who tries to, to answer about uh, methods, about uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, these kind of small projects, small actions? Uh, because we all know that, that uh, municipalities need to report or like to report the big, big things. What do you think? Who Can I um, of course. just offer a suggestion, Serban, that is useful from the educational world? One of the uh, beauties of education is there's a little bit of freedom outside of the restrictions of professional practice. So you almost have license to experiment. Um, and oftentimes universities can push forward on particularly these small scale solutions with experimental approaches like tactical urbanism, like engaging students in community projects and design build projects in cities in real life sites. And sometimes that is with the academic institution and, and their ability to provide real data of the impact on that. That is a way mm -hmm. to start the conversation uh, with authorities and with policymakers that hopefully will trickle up into practice. Not that the practitioners don't know the value of this, they do, but they are restricted by the uh, permits and regulations um, and, and negotiations that are required in the world of policy. And one of the things that we advocate for in our education commission is to train our architect, to call for the training of our architects, of our future architects, to be these kinds of moderators and negotiators mm -hmm. with policymakers and with decision makers. We think that's something that's very important. So it's in a way it's changing our role, adapting our role as architects also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Master Ma Magda. I'm reading from Mustafa Kamal. Ah, uh, Ishtiak, please. You have something. I would like to I'd like to respond briefly on this matter. Yes, uh, actually, when sustainable development goals are uh, designed to be mostly implemented through the municipalities, the local governments. And local mm -hmm. government has three to five years' time. So this is very limited time and they cannot take a big projects. So the project should be the small one. So we don't discriminate project as small scale. All the projects should be small scale so that this can be implemented very easily. And this should be the mainstream and we should make our policymakers understand. So any architects who are involved in the local authority with the local people, has to come up and bring them into the mainstream. This is also the COVID-19 is helping us to think about everything as a community level. You cannot fight this virus without uh, engaging the community into, uh, into the scene. So also projects like the big project should be avoided and small projects or scaled projects should be in the mainstream. This should, this should be our advocacy line uh, in terms of promoting uh, projects. And also, Magda has mentioned the architect needs to be engaged and trained to deal with this, uh, to negotiate with the policymakers in this, uh, uh, to handle, to promote these small scale opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ish. So we need a big picture made of small projects. Uh, so I'm at the end of this debate. I'm very sorry for those who address questions at this point, but I would uh, not uh, like to, to uh, come to the, the final remarks uh, before asking Jyoti uh, on, on some, some uh, vision, some, some uh, thoughts on what uh, we saw and listened today. Jyoti, please join us with some remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, I was um, really intrigued by all the different presentations of very, very interesting uh, presentations. And thank you all very much uh, for these wide range of thought provoking uh, possibilities and, and experiences. Many of them have been actually undertaken. I wanted to mention a couple of things um, that, that I think is perhaps um, going forward, uh, something that we want to build towards. One is that, um, you know, when, when we say, um, I mean, building on sort of 
the, the, the phrase that has been used before, that it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a village, takes an entire town to work together to be able to make a good um, a city, you know, a livable place. So it's not the work of, if not one architect, one uh, designer, one um, visionary mayor makes a livable um, a better city, but really it is bringing together all the different people building that team. So when you're talking about big projects or small projects, or talking about the, uh, you know, that the municipalities offer for big projects and so on. I think we want to keep in mind that regardless of what scale of project we're talking about, we want to create one that has um, the, the engagement of all the different stakeholders locally. And that's really, really important. And I think what has come through in the last, um, the, the completely unimaginable experience uh, that we're living through the last several months is the importance of the local, not just in terms of, um, uh, of local people, but in terms of local governments, uh, of, of you know, the, the local communities, of being able to engage them, of local resources, local knowledge, so that we're able to make the places for those who live there first. And that becomes then uh, uh, valuable for everybody else. And so I think even for architects, it is in a way a sort of rethinking, perhaps an opportunity to rethink, redefine more, articulate more the role that they play in the development of such a such a built environment. That it isn't sort of you know the old idea of a blueprint, but really how are we arriving, helping to facilitate a better uh, living environment at a local level. Um, so I'll just. Um, I, I'll stop there. I mean, there's so many other ideas that we could talk about, but I, I want to stop there because I think that uh, the issues that have been covered from open space to climate change to the SGs, I mean, there's just a huge range of things that one could, one could talk about. And all of those are really, really important. And the priorities have to be set place by place uh, based on what the situations are. I want to just leave you with one other tool that I want to draw your attention to that might be useful, especially in the context of what the really interesting presentation that these the can made and Nelly then uh, explained further, which is um, Culture 2030 indicators. So if you just, uh, you know, and I'll put the, put the web link uh, right here on, on the side, but um, so UNESCO uh, developed the culture mm -hmm. 2030 indicators um, and launched it with uh, 130 ministers of culture during the forum of the culture ministers uh, in November of 2019. And this is, I think, uh, you know, the effort, it was a two year effort to develop uh, these indicators. The idea was that culture was not adequately represented in the 2030 agenda. So when we're talking about architecture for the 2030 agenda, that was precisely our point, was that culture we know is transversely contributing to a number of different um, goals and targets. So we have to demonstrate and make the role more visible. How do we actually measure it? And I wanted to invite you to look at this because I think that it might uh, be useful also as a framework. So we actually took the 169 targets and um, uh, then selected those where we saw culture contributing more directly. And, um, you know, I think that this might be helpful for, um, for a way to measure what you're doing with the um, uh, culture, the architecture for the 2030. So with that, I will stop now and I've put the, um, put the link uh, on the, in the chat. In the chat. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. <laughs> Thank you very much for for this invitation. We are expecting. Uh, yeah, we got the link in the in the chat. That's there. You can copy it if you like. Thank you very much again to all the panelists.
I have to apologize on behalf of Thomas Fournier, the, our president who had to, to uh, leave a little bit, a few minutes earlier. Uh, I thank you very much for your presentations, for your um, uh, patience, for your appreciation, for your questions. But I also have to mention some names which are invisible, but uh, which are behind everything. And they are working currently on floor 47 in Paris in the UIA Secretariat. So I'm thanking Sonia Sella, Muyapi Banjira, uh, Paola Liberato, Emily Bonin, uh, Christine Savano and Emma Wilson. Thank you very much for all your, your uh, help. And I would like to make uh, just one single comment before uh, closing. Uh, some people may think that architecture is what we see. How uh, things humans, humans are building are looking like. But you all demonstrated that it's much more than that. And the invisible part of architecture may be the most important thing for the future. Thank you very much. The show must go on. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Shervan. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone. Bye, Bye. Nice Thank to meet you all. Good night. Thank you, Jyoti. Thank, Thank you, Nadia. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. <laughs> Thank you, Marza. And some hundreds. Thank you. Of Thank you. <laughs> and all the participants. Thank you. <laughs> Nadia, your presentation was really good. <laughs> Thanks, Ishtar. <laughs> it's short. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. <laughs>